Shani, Lizette, how nice to see you. Wukile, hello. Margaret, very good to see you. Hello, Imran, all colleagues, friends, clients. Wuzi, hello. <laughs> now, lovely to see you here. Tim, welcome all the way from Canada. Special welcome to you. <laughs> Wonderful Thank you. to see you here. Thank you for joining us again. And Banele, hello, how are you? Good to see you here again. So nice to have such a lovely crowd. Hello, Filani, how are you? Okay, thank you. Good hello, to see you. Everybody. Yes, hello. And Sifesile, hello to you as well. Margaret is here as well. Moira, Charles, good to see you too. And Violet. Hey, Christina. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Compliments of oh, Thank you. Uh, welcome to 2021, first of all. Um, month is almost finished, but it's still valid. Uh, this is our first webinar uh, in, uh, in a series for this year. We run a series last year. So thank you very much for, for joining us today. Very much appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Christina Knudsen. Um, I'm a director at GDP Global. I'm a keen investment promoter from all sides of the business. So I have been a consultant with GDP Global and director for 15 years. And 10 years, I was an investment promoter for my country, which is Sweden, and um, a job I loved. And what can I love more than doing it for many uh, other countries and, and working with many of you guys and girls. So, so much appreciated. Um, I have a background in both the public sector and the private sector from manufacturing, from service sectors, et cetera. And I'm a market economist. Um, so I think my kind of uh, drummed up years now is about 25. Mm should not say that anymore i think but anyway been in the business for a long time and so much enjoying uh, to being in contact with you all um we are in the middle or at the end or somewhere with this covid problem that is causing problems around the globe and the economy as well as at the personal level to a very great extent and I would like to take this occasion to send um, our best wishes to all of those of you and also my colleagues and associates who have been suffering with COVID, especially in recent times and especially in Southern Africa. Uh, so may we wish you a prompt recovery. Uh, some of you have been really, really badly hit. Others have kind of danced through it. Um, and we also think of those who have lost their loved ones and we had to say many goodbyes and it's been terrible. Um, but, you know, work goes on and we have found many of our investment and trade promotion clients uh, interested to get together, um, share views and, um, and uh, exchange um, experiences and also, of course, to make substantial changes to their modus operandi um, and changes to their plans for, for this year. Um, and uh, investment promotion teams are talking today about what changes are needed to secure FTI, even though at the moment, as you all know, and we struggled with this, the levels are very depressed, not surprisingly. Um, mm. But we should be looking forward, yes, we should try to look at it positively and we should be optimistic that it will rebound, it will. Um, so what is FGI um, going to do this year uh, to countries and economies? Is it going to grow? Is it going to hang around? Is it going to um, um, be um, part of our work? Well, of course it will be. and. Uh, and it will do as 2021 progresses and into, and, and into 2022. So um, to join us in this discussion today, I'm very pleased to welcome our, our panel of, uh, of uh, uh, experts and uh, practitioners, especially investment promotion practitioners. Uh, so we will be uh, running the seminar, uh, sorry, webinar until four o'clock. Um, uh, and um, that is, 
yeah, uh, South African time. Uh, so let me introduce you to Reginald, Reggie. Um, uh, Reggie is the CEO of the Botswana Investment and Trade Center, the BITC. He's an acknowledged international trade and investment economist expert. And uh, BITC is uh, the national agency responsible for attracting and facilitating both domestic and foreign investment into, into Botswana. Uh, Reggie has a great past as well because he worked with institutions like the USAID, SACU, and uh, also he was uh, with the predecessor of BITC was at Bedia, which was then, uh, and we know each other since then, <laughs> uh, Reggie, um, the Botswana Export Development Investment Authority back in the old days. So uh, Reggie's uh, professional experience is about 20 years. Uh, he's also an alumni at the University of Oxford's prestigious Oxford Advanced Leadership and Management Program. Uh, we also have Bea, Beatrice Abel Rosler in investment. Uh, she's an investment promotion manager at the city of Johannesburg. Uh, welcome, Bea. Uh, she has worked there for now 12 years and um, involved in promoting the city of Joburg. Uh, to attract FDI, assist foreign and local companies in Joburg to facilitate business expansion and also to fast track investment projects. Um, and she also cooperates with embassies, trade commissions and chambers. And uh, we know each other since um, the good old days when Bea was uh, working at the at WIPA, the World Investment, uh, the World Association of Investment Promotion Agencies. I'm sure you, or most of you know, know WIPA, um, when she was based in Geneva and she holds a Master in Investment Promotion Economic Development. Welcome, Bea. And uh, finally, James. James Mill is Head of Investment Promotion at Westgro, the Western Cape um, Provincial Economic Promotion and Tourism Agency. And uh, um, James, it's lovely to have you here. Um, James is, uh, has supported a lot of FDI into, into the Western Cape uh, at the tune of kind of 8 billion rand or you know, just about a half a million um, dollars of investment into the local economy, supporting the creation of over 4,000 jobs. And, um, and his investment promotion teams has uh, supported quite a few well-known companies into the Cape, uh, Amazon, Hisense, Kimberly Clark, Distel, Derwish. Um, I'm very happy to have been to see some of these investments that they, they have landed in the Cape, uh, very impressive. Uh, so um, uh, James, oh, before uh, joining Westgrove, also worked as a consulting um, as a consultant at the research firm Frost and Sullivan, uh, specializing in commercial due diligence, African infrastructure, analytics, cross-border growth strategy and development. Uh, so uh, James holds a master in development finance from the University of Cape Town. So my thanks go to this very prominent panel and very experienced. Uh, real investment promoters at heart and um, very successful. Uh, and uh, thank you for sharing your views in a few minutes and to stimulate this interesting discussion that we're gonna have. Um, and we want to have of your, your thoughts, yes, your, your real thoughts, your deep thoughts and views. So please um, um, uh, share those with all the participants. And those of you who want to pose questions, which I do hope you will do because we love questions, uh, put them in the chat, please, and raise your hands, etc., uh, so we can have um, um, a, a good session. Um, and the video, just so you know, will be uh, sent to you uh, afterwards, yes. Uh, so starting uh, the webinar is John Hanna, my colleague, director at GDP Global. Um, and uh, he will review the global economy and the latest prognostics, prognostications in FDI for the year. And then we will start uh, after that with a Q&A session with the panel. Uh, so you can contribute towards that, okay? And then the questions will come up later. So thank you very much. And uh, over to you, John. 
Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for uh, joining this webinar. Happy New Year to you, and uh, I share all the comments that Christina has uh, made uh, to you. Um, we are living in difficult COVID times. I thought that we would be through this by Easter time, but it seems now it's going to take many months more. Hopefully, towards the uh, end of this year, we may well see uh, some improvements. I wanted to raise uh, a few points just to get the conversation going. Uh, a, a few general points regarding the global picture, then uh, some data from uh, Southern Africa, and then some strategies that are perhaps key to investment promotion for certainly the foreseeable few months. Let me start by just raising a few points in, in these uh, slides. And the first thing is, um, I think we should be optimistic. Clearly, uh, all economies have been affected, but we need now to be preparing for a, an economic recovery, not only globally, but especially locally and regionally. We need to be working on this. If you look at the data right now, clearly the global economy is in recession. Every country has been affected. Uh, most countries have been affected quite badly, certainly in uh, North America, in Europe, and in much of Asia, countries have been, uh, they are currently in recession and uh, uh, experiencing quite significant year-on-year -year GDP declines. So the global economy is in recession for sure, but it is going to recover we should expect improvements in GDP growth. And, uh, and I think therefore we'll start to see a fairly quick recovery in FDI and also in uh, aspects of trade. Uh, China's economy is already showing year on year growth. Even in 2020, growth was around 45% uh, annually, despite having some early uh, declines. Now, that growth rate for China is the lowest it's had for, I think, over 20 years. But still, we know that China has been able to manage this uh, COVID situation quite well and is certainly growing. But it's not growing through international trade. Um, it's growing more through domestic economic uh, growth. And China does need to find ways to, to balance its economy going forward. It, it needs to find ways to offset the challenges to some of it, the global value chains that are in China. So China will have some challenges going forward, uh, but for the moment, people in China are benefiting from economic growth. India, India is, in the, is stuck in the, uh, the COVID environment at the moment. We've probably seen on TV the challenges India has, but its economy is scheduled to rebound pretty well and also to recover through to the whole of the financial year 21-22. So those two large economies are expected to do well, and they will be important drivers for economic growth, both in their own economies, but also in uh, all economies, including uh, developing economies. I think we can also be fairly clear that uh, global business, and we're, when we think of FDI, foreign direct investment, we are thinking of uh, businesses that have spread their global value chains as part of a globalized economy. Most of those global value chains have been already put under a lot of scrutiny for restructuring. And so that's both a threat and an opportunity to uh, countries in Africa, especially South Africa, Southern Africa. Some investments that have been established in South Africa will continue to do well, but one or two, we should not be surprised if, if investors greatly restructure those investments and maybe to a short-term detriment in, in terms of job creation. But at the same time, I would suggest well, as we go forward and uh, look at strategies for the next uh, 12 months, two years, we need to think about researching sectors and based on those sectors of opportunity, studying how the value chains are changing and then creating new positioning statements uh, for our own regions or, or countries. Another uh, component I wanted to highlight, we know that businesses are transforming and they're going through certainly a digital disruption so they have, like, like us in, in economic promotion terms, we've had to learn to work largely uh, remotely, working from home, 
working part-time, home and office. Businesses are, are also doing the same. That could be an opportunity to attract businesses. But similarly, you might find that employment in large cities could be different in the future. There may be changes to the way businesses actually work and the way people go to work, as well as uh, businesses looking to respond really fast in their global business opportunities in the future. So through that global disruption, and in the previous webinar, we talked about some of these disruptive technologies. I think those cities and regions that can respond well, not just with digital infrastructure, but especially with uh, digital knowledge workers, employees and contractors, third party players, local businesses that can actually take part in the digital economy real efficiently, they will stand to do well, I think, in the future. Regional and city economies are changing. I think I can say that from a global perspective. Every city economy is being affected. Uh, if I think of London, my, my home city, it's not quite empty, but it's extremely quiet. And yet business is continuing. The financial services sector is continuing. So the physical environment of the city looks different. And as I mentioned earlier, remote working is a key uh, requirement going forward. So I think, again, working uh, in the IPAs, we need to double check that not only our colleagues in our agencies and also in the economic development departments, but also the businesses and even employees, potential employees, are able to access and have the right skills to work remotely. I think that's that could be key to making sure that all the job opportunities are, are harnessed. Another one to just be mindful of, I think, is manufacturing. And in South and Southern Africa, of course, that's a key driver. Uh, South Africa, Southern Africa is the, probably the most industrialized or you know, the most industrialized part of the African continent. The opportunities are there for in industrial activity, manufacturing. But we will probably find that in terms of creating new investment opportunities, manufacturing will be slower to respond than, say, companies in the service sector, the services economy. And when I th think of services, I'm talking about business services and financial services. So we need to have a twin track approach in investment promotion. We need to do everything to build businesses inside the IDZs, the SEZs, in our industrial areas. And we'll talk about some of those techniques in a moment, but we also need to make sure we are taking advantage of the business services sector and the financial services sector, ICT sector. Another key sector in the services economy, of course, is tourism. And uh, as you've probably seen in Southern Africa and your regions, the local tourism economy is, is probably the most important right now. It's going to take, I think, several months before we're able to anticipate large-scale numbers of tourists being able to come and visit and spend their, their dollars and euros and so on in our local economies. So I would encourage everybody to take a, an indication of this approach going forward from the global economy. Think not just about the manufacturing sector, but really focus as much as you can on the service, uh, the services business, financial services, the creative sector going forward. Uh, so strategies, well, I'm going to cover those in a second. I don't know if you can see this slide here. The data is a little bit delayed. We know from earlier in this year that uh, GDP was heavily affecting South Africa and of course its neighboring economies. You can see here in the second quarter of 2020, GDP down 51%, which is huge. And certain sectors that we know about, uh, construction, manufacturing, mining, transportation, and international trade, those were all heavily affected. And also household spending was down in many sectors. The situation has improved in South Africa. I don't have all the data in front of me, but I do know that in our, our panel discussion shortly, we'll be able to get some insights from Western Cape, from Johannesburg, and from Botswana, and also from you yourselves, colleagues, 
from your different vantage points in Namibia, Botswana, Lesotho, uh, more widely than that. So economies have been affected, but generally the impacts are slowing down in, in terms of negative impacts. So going forward, my suggestion before we hear from your views is that we still need to look at a post-COVID strategy for 2021 and then an onward strategy into 2022. So I've just picked out a few bullet points here. I think aftercare or BRE, business retention and expansion, we really need to look at good practices everywhere to make sure that our IPA teams have actually done the, the best they possibly can to support the existing FDI stock. The second one down is, is looking at the supply chains that those companies are uh, those foreign investors that, that we have, they will be under some pressure to rearrange their supply chains. In some cases, that might mean a pressure on nearshoring or reshoring. Some of those companies will be reducing the risk in their global value chains by bringing some of their investments more close to the, the actual customer markets. So for example, if it's a German automotive manufacturer, they will perhaps want to think about having things more uh, closely aligned to their, their actual markets rather than necessarily having a huge chunk of their value chains in, in, in regions that could be affected going forward. When we also think about local uh, value chains, this is where I think we really need to work with our SMMEs, the small and medium enterprises. We need to make sure that we have the programs in place to help companies get the most out of uh, global value chains, as well as serving the needs of the local, local and regional markets. I think also we need to keep an eye out on the short and medium term economic trends and opportunities in, in our or in your particular part of the world. Um, so I would strongly suggest that you look at beefing up the, the research and uh, analysis team efforts in your IPAs. These are some of the top level aspects that I, I would like to say, focus on uh, FDI, focus on the value chains, look at the way SMMEs are being affected and make sure you have a good intelligence base going forward to anticipate opportunities. In terms of aftercare services, you'll see when you look back at this webinar uh, recording, the kind of services that foreign investors are, are looking for. They need help to, to change their business models. And that will often mean assistance with permits, finding the opportunity to bring in key workers to help transform their, their businesses. Uh, there will be other operational uh, requirements in their mind. And then longer term, they'll be looking at the approach that uh, could play out in your city or in your SEZ in order to build new value chains in your location. So there are at least three ways of looking at the services your team should be providing to the foreign investors that you have decided to. Thank you very much, Christina. I'm going to finish there because of time. Uh, colleagues uh, on the webinar, I thank you for your time. And now we will uh, go back to Christina to take the panel and let's get some discussion going in this webinar. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you very much, John, for those insights and for sharing that with us all. Um, for the panel discussion, uh, we have James Milne. Uh, he represents a provincial agency, and that is the, the West Grow. Um, uh, the Western Cape uh, Province Agency. Uh, Reginald Celello, Reggie, uh, represents the um, Botswana Investment and Trade Center, which is where he's the COO, and he has um, uh, obviously representing a national agency. And Bea, Beatrice Abel Rosler, is uh, representing the city of Johannesburg, where she is the investment promotion manager. Uh, so I would like to start with, um, with Reggie. Uh, and, uh, the, and the questions we have here on your screen, how has your country, how has Botswana been affected by FDI uh, this year? And, uh, you know, what does it mean? How is the, the impact uh, on GDP at the regional, local uh, level? Has there been job losses? Have you counted those? Has there been any job gains? Has, have you seen company losses, exports, and other business and economic matters that has hit Botswana? Uh, Reggie, thank you. 
Well, uh, th thank you so much, Christina, for first for introducing me. And also thank you so much for sharing um, thoughts. Um, John, thank you so much for your thoughts and insights. Well, with respect to the, the question in front of us, um, impact of uh, COVID uh, on, on the economy of Botswana, uh, well, as you may well be aware, the pandemic and its uh, subsequent containment measures, you know, they put in uh, serious um, or severe negative consequences on, on, on the economy of Botswana. And, um, you know, because of the situation, we've had uh, inevitably uh, disruptions uh, brought about um, mainly, uh, of course, on the economy because of weakened um, global demand, particularly for our major exports. You know, Botswana is highly dependent on, 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 on exports of diamonds, and this indeed has been uh, uh, disrupted quite significantly. We, we've experienced uh, major disruptions in, in, in supply chains and consequently reduced uh, consumption um, across a number of, uh, of sectors. And as a result uh, of this uh, drop, of course, in, in, in exports, We've had uh, challenges, particularly with a uh, drop in government revenues and certainly a need for our government to consider some kind of a reprioritization uh, of government spending uh, plans as well as commitments. So on, on, on the job side, uh, on the job side, we've had uh, job losses uh, across a number of sectors, particularly uh, on the hospitality and tourism. Uh, you know, the tourism sector is one of the key sectors of the economy in Botswana. And because of the containment measures, uh, we've, we've had challenges bringing in uh, tourists uh, to Botswana. So you realize that the hotels and tourism sector in Botswana has done quite, uh, hasn't done very well. And that's why we've had um, the significant challenges. You asked about uh, GDP uh, of Botswana and how it's been affected. If you look at um, quarter, you know, quarter on quarter, um, we, we, you realize that the uh, the impact of COVID has quite have been very very strong on 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 on, on Botswana. Projections by our Ministry of Finance and Economic Development, uh, as well as the IMF, suggest um, a, a deterioration in economic growth uh, for Botswana, with the estimates uh, of GDP. Uh, declining uh, by about 8.9%. Uh, initially, the, the contraction was expected to, about 30, to be about 13.1%, 13, 13 and now it has been um, revised downwards to about 8.9%. So th th this is a concern, uh, Christina. You realize that um, because of the COVID situation, we're really living in a, what, what they normally refer to as a a radical uncertain um, environment. It's a radical uncertain because, as you can see, the projections are not definitive. You realize that um, they keep moving. Each time you talk to the IMF or to the World Bank, all these projections from UNTAD, um, they keep uh, moving. When we started off uh, with the pandemic, uh, uh, UNTAD was expecting global FDI to drop by about 30%. Today, we're looking at um, 40, 40 to 45% decline in FDI. And so these are some of the challenges that um, we, we, we really see. I mean, if we look at the latest IMF forecasts, um, you realize the domestic economy is expected to contract by 9.6%. Uh, that's according to the IMF. And, and these are issues, uh, as they bring out the world, the, the world economic uh, outlook, you realize there are different uh, changes that, that we, keep, uh, we keep seeing. Botswana is a landlocked country. We depend quite uh, a lot on, on, on uh, global supply chains. Uh, we depend quite significantly on um, the movement of goods across borders and so forth. So with, with the impact of COVID, we've had uh, quite a significant amount of challenge, particularly um, you know, leading to a rise in prices as well as shortages, particularly of um, you know, food items and some other critical um, components such as your fuel, fuel and so forth. 
And then on the export side of things, um, if you look at um, in, in October, um, our, our data is a little bit um, behind. If you look at the October uh, statistics, uh, the overall exports uh, for the country recorded a decline of 36.9%. That's quite heavy, 36.9%. Uh, if you compare it to, to a decline of a, uh, that we experienced also in September uh, 2020. This decline was brought about by uh, decline in our major export commodity, which is diamonds, which uh, declined by 40.2%. So you realize that exports really declined for, for diamonds, thus causing ripple effect on the rest of the, of the economy. On the import side, um, the imports have also shrunk, uh, albeit uh, slightly uh, by about 0.3 percent and um, be between October and, 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 and uh, September. So you, you, you real, re realize that we as a country we've really had this uh, trade deficit over the last uh, few months of the of, of the pandemic, so so on the overall, um, as, as as I've already noted, um, we, we've had impact uh, such that impact in in in, a, in our economy. On FDI, more, much more specifically, um, we've had depressed levels of FDI, and uh, we 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 are in expectation. We expect the economy to to rebound. We expect FDI to rebound. Of course, we, we haven't had uh, opportunity to do the traditional uh, marketing uh, that we've always done, but we've changed the text now to do things quite a lot differently. And I mean, as, as, as we discuss, I'll, I'll be able to share exactly in terms of uh, our APA forecast, what sort of new areas of uh, intervention have we put in place um, to mitigate against the the losses that we've we've, we've come across, so that's okay. sort of uh, issues that we've had, Christina. Okay, hold on there because that's the second question. You were just kind of penetrating those answers there that we would like to have. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. Uh, Reggie, that's excellent. That's a, a good roundup. It's uh, I, I like the you know, radical uncertainty. Yeah, because that's where we all are. That's so where we are and everything. It's new to us to have this uncertainty. We can't do the prognosis. It's difficult to make the plans, and you know all the ripple effects that we have. Um, but thank you so but, much. But, 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 but Christina, having said that, I mean, I I, I know I've put, uh, I've put out a, a gloomy picture. I've, put, I've pictured a, a gloomy picture ahead of us, but the projections uh, do show that into into the future there's a rebound that is coming. Um, I mean, with the IMF saying um, they expect a rebound in about 2022 of about 5.4% and, and so forth. So we, we, we're really hoping for the economy to, to come back yeah. after this. It yeah. Yes, of course it will do. Uh, may, I, may I turn to Bea representing the city of Joburg uh, with the same question? Excellent. Okay, um, let's, so, so John started a bit and, uh, you know, gave a bit our, our decline in, in GDP instead of having a growth, we have been taking big losses in terms of GDP, we have been losing a big amount of jobs as well, we are now over 30% of, uh, of unemployment, it was, the official rate was used to be 20%, it was always bigger than that, but now it's really... Uh, it, it's depressing and uh, close, very close to my office is actually the Department of Labor. So every morning when I was, well, the mornings when I was driving to work, I saw actually people queuing outside, not once around the block, but twice around the block. So really heartbreaking, you know, numbers is one thing, but what is happening on the ground is for me more more important actually. Um, having said that, um, I need to give a bit of background with respect where I am, where I'm sitting. So we are not a lone standing IPA. We are, this is City of Johannesburg, we are part, uh, part of the Department of Economic Development and within the department there is a unit which is trade and investment. Um, having said that, we are obviously whatever we are doing is impacting on what is happening financially at the city level. And now I can tell you that our good president shut down the county for 35 days, which was surely a wise decision when it comes to the virus. 
but due to the shutdown, we lost more than 1 billion of revenues for the city. That's 1 billion which is missing in our budget, which means that we don't have additional money when we would need additional money. It's actually the opposite. We are having less money, we can spend less. Um, which is obviously having a big impact on what we are doing, what we are trying to do. Now, I would like to shift as well a bit on the practical side, because doing investment promotion for the city is actually more a business facilitation. Lots of uh, investment facilitation issues and items are sitting on the city level. Uh, we are speaking about uh, building plan permits, we are speaking about site development plans, we are speaking about water and electricity connection. Now, you need colleagues to be able to facilitate investments. So the city being very concerned about the well-being of all of us, have a kind of scheduled work for each of us. Which means as well that some colleagues, yes, you can reach them by email, you can reach them on the mobile. Others you can't, which is making the investment facilitation part particularly difficult in times where we are tempted to focus on investment facilitation and business retention. Um, we, we are quite blessed because in terms of business retention and even ongoing investments, I've been sitting quite on a big pipeline of projects, which I've been able to pull over regardless what is happening out there. I'm actually more concerned, not about this financial year, but about next financial year, because as much as I'm working on the pipeline, I'm getting my investment facilitation through. I don't have that much of the ability to get new projects in the pipeline. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bea. Uh, I'm aware of timing, so I'd I like to just uh, uh, pass the same question now to, to James uh, at Westgrow. Uh, James, go ahead. Thanks. Thanks, Christina. And uh, th thanks to GDP Global for facilitating this, this webinar. And I think good afternoon, everyone. I, I think we're tackling a, a very interesting set of questions. And I, I think Reginald and Beatrice have really provided some interesting insights. I mean, um, you know, I, I think John laid the platform earlier um, you know, South Africa is in a, went into a recession. I think, um, you know, the last sort of quarterly stats were released by Stats SA in September. And, and uh, I think for the country, we, we, we were estimated to have shared about uh, over 2.2 million jobs. So a very significant impact in, in terms of, of the virus. Uh, and then if you look at a more granular level, which is sort of the, the focus of, of, of Westcrow, which is the Western Cape region, um, many of you would know us more by, by Cape Town as the city, but we also, we also we cover the, the province as well as Cape Town. Um, and you know, looking at the stats that were released, we, we lost about uh, just over 320,000 jobs uh, quarter on quarter in, in, in that period. So. It's, it's been an extremely devastating time uh, for business and for the economy. And I think, you know, uh, the, the other presenters have, have spoken about it, but it's, it's also been an extremely uncertain time. It's, it's very, very hard to predict what's about to happen. And I think uh, Beatrice touched on it. You know, the, the country was, was, was put into a hard lockdown, which, you know, from, from the perspective of the virus itself was, has been very effective. And I think globally well recognized as, as, relatively well coordinated, but, but obviously from an economic standpoint, um, the first lockdown was, was extremely tough for, for business um, and government was able to release some stimulus measures, which, which I think uh, you know, businesses did tend to take advantage of some of the measures that were available. And I think that was quite positive. But I, I, I think what's quite concerning now is that as we enter the second wave of infections, we're, so, uh, we're you know, broadly speaking, quite Quite heavily locked down, so we're at level three out of out of five levels, um, and I think you know the, the the effects of those closures are starting to become more and more significant. There's less economic stimulus available to businesses. Uh, borders being closed are, are really uh, practically affecting the possibility of, of doing doing trade. 
and you know on a on a practical perspective from investment it's also affecting uh, the possibility of investors coming into the country so i think we we've got a similar issue to to uh what beatrice spoke about where um you know 2020 as a year wasn't necessarily the worst year for us and i think that that goes down to good pipeline management it means that you've got deals in the pipeline that you initiated four or five years we're losing you there uh we're losing the sound that are coming to fruition now those kind of okay um, uh, sorry sorry about that can you hear me yes now we can yes thank you um thank you Jay. okay so sorry about sorry about that um yeah so, so just the last thing is yeah i i was just mentioning that i, th I think the biggest challenge going forward is is going to be maintaining a consistent pipeline through a period of, of possibly quite long uncertainty. You know, uh, it's not clear globally, uh, obviously the vaccine will help, but it's not clear globally, you know, at which times different countries are gonna come online or which, which times certain countries might close down again. And I think that that's really impactful for, for managing of our investment pipelines. So yeah, very interesting and uh, unusual times for us as investment promoters. Mm, indeed it is. Um, may I just um, kind of turn to you now for the second question so we can get a good roll on this. So what actions is Wesco um, taking at the moment to stabilize, you know, the you know what, what are you doing? What are in your plans? Sure. So, so Christina, I think what, what's interesting for us is that right from the onset, we were able to work in a very coordinated manner with, with uh, other stakeholders in the investment ecosystem. Um, and I mean that end to end from, from other uh, players, other municipalities, the local government, the provincial government, and also national governments. And I think, you know, to, to sort of demonstrate that in, a, in an example, um, I think on the, the 16th of March was the first time the, the grouping of stakeholders had a meeting around what are we going to do, um, you know, in, in terms of the pandemic. So this is in 2020. And two weeks later, as the country went in, on the day the country went into lockdown, we were able to launch a, a new website. Uh, it's called supportbusiness.co.za. And that website was used to uh, almost as a face to business or a communication system with business. Um, it basically provides updates on what's happening in terms of lockdown stages. It allowed businesses to interpret, um, you know, what 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 impacts uh, of the lockdown might might be on their business and what forms they may require to continue operating. We also launched a tool that provided businesses um, with guidance around accessing economic stimulus as well. Uh, and I think that, you know, the real value was that it was a coordinated effort. It wasn't owned by Westcro, it was owned by all this, all sort of government stakeholders across the spectrum. And that allowed people to work together to, to really make sure that clear communications were being made to business. Um, and so I think at the moment, you know, that it's, it's, it's almost something that, that continues to transition through time. So, so now that we have that interface with business and businesses have been using it, um, I think over the course of time, more than 100,000 businesses had, had uh, accessed the site um, and more than 6,000, for example, used the tool to try and access uh, economic stimulus. And so what that's meant for us is that we now have very good data uh, in terms of the businesses we're communicating with. And going forward, you know, that, that will be the means of communicating with businesses on strategies that are being undertaken. Uh, and I think, look, at a, at a very broad level, it still remains quite uncertain um, what what comes next, but we, we continue to work closely with all of our stakeholders around a, a recovery plan and just ensuring that businesses are kept well informed uh, through the cycle as we go into the second wave. Mm -hmm. And I would guess this uh, website and this recovery plan and, and the stimulus package also includes foreign companies or is it? Um, so yes, so, so that's a good question. So it's it's mainly oriented around local companies, but it, it does have a significant component around uh, particularly aimed at foreign companies who are trying to understand whether they can get into the country, you know, what sort of measures will apply to them in terms of accessing the country, um, all those sort of things, even, even health measures as well. So what do they require if they're going to come and travel here to look at an investment or do due diligence, then we, we can help them through the website as well. So, so 
it, it's oriented mainly towards local businesses, but it, it does support queries that relate to international investors as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, thank you very much, um, James. You were early out then when you created this um, uh, website and that you had the meeting uh, kind of timely uh, uh, in mid-March uh, to kind of get prepared very early and to support the companies. May I turn to Reggie now uh, about, you know, what actions are on the Botswana uh, BITC uh, level are, are, be are being taken to address the matters we have discussed? Yeah. Sure. No, thank you so much, uh, Christine. I think, as you know, BITC is part of the bigger ecosystem. And um, at, a, at a country level, there's quite been a lot that has been done by government. Uh, probably before I get into what we're doing as BITC much more specifically, just to say, as part of the mitigation efforts by government, the government has put in place what we call an economic recovery and transformation plan, ERTP. So the ERTP sort of chart a, a strategy of how Botswana intends to come out of this uh, pandemic. And it, it, it's also a way of promoting opportunities for economic uh, diversification. At, at now, getting, getting down specifically to the BITC, as an institution, as you are aware, we provide um, factory space to our companies, factory shelves to our companies. So during the COVID, um, you know, when, at the beginning of the COVID situation, during the lockdowns, uh, we, we provide our companies or companies that are renting out uh, from our factory shelves, rental deferments for all our tenants for uh, three to six months uh, with the uh, repayments uh, plan made up, up, up to about 12 months. Um, in addition to that, we've increased um, our information sharing uh, speed with, with our companies uh, because at this point, companies require much more information. So we've accelerated our um, uh, invest after care services and just to ensure that we much, much closer to our companies uh, through uh, enhanced uh, partnerships. In addition to that, and very, very importantly, um, is the fact that we developed a domestic investment and retention strategy, uh, what you call DINR, a domestic investment and retention strategy. This domestic investment and retention strategy is, is targeted at a number of areas. So we stepped up, uh, stepped up our activities around uh, market intelligence, information sharing, and also the second part of it is around building strategic partnerships with uh, cooperatives. Uh, as a country, we have a cooperative system, particularly um, across um, the districts in Botswana. So we've partnered with a number of cooperatives to build local um, economy. Uh, we, we partnered with a, 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 an agency, rather the a cooperative in Madinare, uh, where we were able to bring out uh, an investor to partner with this cooperative to grow um, over 750,000 citrus uh, trees. Now we're moving on to another cooperative in, 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 um, in, in, in Shoshong. It's called in the central district of Botswana, which will also bring about some additional uh, investment opportunities uh, to, to Botswana. Also very key to us as part of our domestic investment and retention strategy is the local economic development um, plan. So we, we sort of partnering with the different districts and localities to develop local content, to develop local um, economies around around those 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 places. Here we're looking at uh, issues around uh, salt. Um, we're looking at domestic opportunities within the specific localities um, around around Botswana. The other key key component of our domestic and investment strategy is around supplier development program, the SDP, where we're looking at key uh, value chains of horticulture textiles and apparel, uh, diamond, uh, rather mining, consumables, and so forth. So we partnered with the rest of the other players within the economy to ensure that we build um, economies around this, uh, these key sectors. So these are very, very critical for us uh, in ensuring that the domestic economy um, sort of moves um, as we, we, we continue to promote um, FDI. 
uh, on the one hand. The, 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 the other thing that um, we, 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 we took seriously as an institution is uh, around our digital infrastructure. We sort of upped our game, particularly around the digital infrastructure, to ensure that we promote uh, digitally across across the world. So we've had several webinars. Uh, we've had one, of course, with Westgrow, and we, we really appreciate that and continue to to look forward to uh, more opportunities for us to, to partner with, with, with our uh, sister IPAs across the region. And also uh, very, very important um, as part of our strategy is uh, investor targeting, uh, particularly around global value chains. Uh, we're looking at opportunities uh, where we could have near shoring, particularly for companies in the automotive co uh, automotive component sector, just to see how we could bring them a, a much, much closer to the, the hub, which is South Africa, um, as a, as the automotive hub, which is uh, South Africa. Probably the, the, the other thing that I could talk about at, at, at this stage is the fact that we, we, as an institution, we've also gone ahead to assist in um, providing our companies with information, uh, particularly from the government side. This is information and assistance around access to government relief packages, um, uh, support around the industry support facility, um, which is one of the, the, the support systems that the government has put in place. In particular, the government uh, has put in place um, a, a, an industry support facility to the tune of 1.3 uh, billion pula to assist um, companies that are existing uh, to ensure that we retain those businesses within the country and ensure that they don't fold as a result of uh, this uh, situation. So I thought I should uh, highlight uh, those um, a few pointers. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Reggie. Uh, that sounds um, like you are doing a lot, and especially this in uh, domestic investment and retention strategy. Um, and uh, may I quickly pass on to Bea now uh, about the, uh, the actions that um, the city of Johannesburg and especially you know, the Department of Economic Development of the city so as a city in, in South Africa, we have been lucky in terms of budget because as much as the national and the provincial governments, their, their financial year is going from the 1st of April to the 31st of March. Our financial year is only starting on the 1st of July, going to the 30th of June, which means when we created our budget, the virus was already full in flow. And it was quite vi visible that um, there will be a second wave. Um, so therefore, immediately in the, in the budget for the current financial year uh, 2021, we actually um, budgeted for over 400 social and economic infrastructure projects, which will mostly go to the community. We will try to involve as many SMMEs as possible. In the same time, we are as well trying to set up cooperatives. That's something which, um, due to political changes uh, at the city level, uh, was kind of falling apart for four years. And now we are back into uh, setting up cooperatives, which is really helpful uh, in certain areas of the city. So that's now infrastructure. That's the big picture. When it comes to economic development, we are going digital as much as we can. That means that we have, thanks goodness that again, we started before COVID. We have seven opportunity centers in Johannesburg um, in, in each re region one where people can come in, they can register companies, they have access to, uh, to the internet. There is a work seeker database where they can register. And we are trying now to, to, to go bigger when it comes to that. So it's not only going to be a work seekers database as SMMEs will be able to register. We will try to pull those guys into our city supply chain, into our infrastructure pro, uh, projects. When it comes to investment promotion, mm -hmm. um, I was quite tough here uh, in the department and I made it very clear that I want as much digital as possible. 
So we should be before the before end of March, we should have an investor portal online and good to go. And we should have an exporter portal online as well, where we're going to be able to capture and to service investors and uh, potential exporters directly. Uh, you know, somehow, I think the whole virus is giving us a push where we had hesitations before. And um, I will come back for your last question. Okay. Remember that, that as well, there is money which has been saved in certain places. Yeah. So, but let's speak later about that. So for us, it's all about going digital uh, as much as we can, because yeah. there is not going to be traveling. And as well, uh, from what I see from my family and you and friends in Europe, uh, it's not going back to the old ways, the ways of having meetings and flying around the world. That's not going to happen anymore. Yeah. So in my head, the more you can invest for decent IT facilities within your, your organization, the better. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Bea. Uh, I'm very interested to hear that you're getting a portal for investment and for export because the city of Joburg really lacked having that. Um, didn't you? Because when you're part of a department and you don't have your own website, you can't really, you know, go crazy with uh, the, you know, all the digital means that we have. And, but uh, why don't we just continue with you, Bea, now, and we go, go into what advice uh, would you like to share with your oh, no, uh, colleagues around uh, the region and further afield? For, for us, it was all about reshuffling our budget in a time where you don't need to travel. And believe me, officials in South Africa loved traveling. So we had a big budget. No. In a time where you, um, that's something South African, it's called IDP process, um, where you actually call every two years big meetings in where the communities can participate in the development of the budget. All of the stuff is not happening physical anymore. That's online. It's, it's in another way. Therefore, there is a big chunk of budget which has been freed and which will has been re-employed for digital means. And that's really my advice to everybody. Whatever piece of money you find, which you know you won't use it in 21, believe me. I mean, once again, you can hear by my terrible accent that I'm German by birth. I'm holding the French nationality. So I, I really know what is happening in Europe. Traveling is not going to happen. So just take this travel budget. Just take the budget for catering and you name it and see that you put that in, in a decent digital equipment. Uh, if you need to create a website, if you need to create a portal as we need to do that, do it. If you just need to get laptops for your stuff, please do so. Um, because once again, it's not only about this year. The business community globally is changing habits. And we will carry on to have those kind of interactions which we have right now. And that's it, I guess, from my side. Thank you, Bea. You're absolutely spot on. I agree with you on all those um, addresses. James, what is uh, your piece of advice? Thanks, Christina. Yeah, I mean, look, maybe I can just follow on directly from what Bea is saying. I mean, I, I noted a few little points, but I think you know, number one, I'd say going forward, uh, you and your team need a seamless ability to to work remotely. So to me, that's you know the ability to easily and sort of seamlessly is the word to take calls via Zoom, via Teams, via whatever me medium it might be with investors. So I think you know there's re really been a big change in terms of people can speak to you immediately about about what's going on, and I think you need to be you know professional and proficient in uh, chatting to them on any medium immediately. Um, and then I think going beyond that as an organization, I, th I think, you know, investment promotion agencies should really be understanding how can they transition the organization uh, from a digital perspective. So I think you need to be able to host really effective uh, webinars um, online. Your team should, should know how to do that extremely well and have a process for doing it. 
Um, you also should be able to host events online if you need to do that as well. So I, th I think there's a whole uh, you know group of areas that 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 should be done digitally that 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 are really important as well. Um, then I think you know from a more practical perspective, uh, there's sort of a shift in focus um, from what was previously our normal working structures. So I think uh, both both Beer and Reginald have spoken about the the, the need for business aftercare or uh, retention and expansion. You know, really focusing uh, your current work on on local companies and making sure that they survive. Number one, but also then helping them to understand where growth opportunities are and 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 actually pinpointing those companies and, and helping them to grow. Because I think we, we're all cognizant of the fact that attracting foreign investment is going to be quite difficult for the next uh, year or so. Um, so really the opportunity lies, lies in the local companies. Um, then I think, you know, I, I noted down here pipeline management. So I think I spoke earlier about the fact that, um, you know, it, we, the deals we're closing now are, are ones that we'd worked on from a few years ago. And, and the real concern is, is about the impact of last year and this year on deal flow. Um, so I think you know, organizations need to do everything they can to make sure that they're still generating leads. Uh, and I think you know, where, what, what we've done is uh, and something, something new to us has been actually commissioning lead generation services in other markets uh, using service providers. Uh, and the reason for that is mainly that we we can't travel at the moment, uh, or, or it's very difficult to plan your travel properly. And so you don't want to lose momentum in key markets. And so if you can commission research uh, or lead generation overseas, then that's an angle you could look at. Um, and then maybe just a sort of more practical step uh, that we've looked at is, is, is also using this time to commission research. So understanding your sectors better, understanding the sub opportunities within those sectors as well. So um, it's, it's a great time to strengthen your research capacity um, because a lot of, a lot of the, your team isn't traveling. And then finally, the last point, and I, I, I think maybe uh, I see a question from Violet uh, Kawaii as well um, around, around sort of digital technologies. My last point was really, uh, you know, around leveraging technology to, to drive innovation in your work. So I think, um, as Beer was saying earlier, it's, 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 this time has really forced us to go, geez, we need to look at what we're doing with technology and how do we make our work more efficient? Um, and I think two examples that, that I wrote down from our side in terms of experiences is, is, is one, undertaking virtual missions. So um, the investment team has been looking at how to, how to take virtual missions. So basically spending a few days prioritizing meetings in a particular country as if you were traveling to that country. Um, but instead of being there physically, you know, you're hosting a webinar and then maybe in, engaging investors one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I think our export teams had, had done a fantastic transition there where they've actually hosted export missions um, with buyers on the other side of the world and they've even sent product there. So they've done wine tasting uh, with, for example, buyers in Korea where they conducted a, a sort of a virtual mission and you know, they tasted the wines with, with the people while not being physically with them. So I think, I think that was a really good example of innovation. Um, and then the, the last one that, that I noted down on our side was around uh, fund matchmaking. So stemming from the sort of process where we, we tried to matchmake people to funds on our website, uh, born out of the economic stimulus measures, we've now actually developed a sort of white label solution with a service provider where companies can come through our website and, and really pinpoint uh, funds that are available for them across uh, South Africa. And so we're hopefully launching that uh, towards the end of this month and we're, we're excited to see how it goes. Um, but I, you know, I, I just thought those are two interesting examples of how technology is really enabling us to do a, a whole tranche of our work uh, much more effectively and efficiently. And I think you know, this is just the beginning. There could be a whole host of other examples that, that we need to explore. Um, and, and I think this is a great time to try things out. Well, thank you very much, James, for sharing all of that um, activity that is being undertaken by, by, by Westgrow and, you know, with the, together with stakeholders. Uh, I don't see much questions there. Violet has been active. And Bea, can you check the chat? Because there's a question for you that you need to respond to uh, from uh, Violet, from Salga. Please go ahead, Reggie. What, uh, what is your advice? Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. I think uh, I'll take the cue from Beatrice and, and James. 
Uh, I think for, for us, the, the biggest thing remains investing in digital infrastructure, just ensuring that you, you get your digital infrastructure correct. Um, as, as James has already pointed out, uh, um, virtual meetings, virtual um, trade promotion missions are the in thing now, uh, both on the investment promotion side as well as the export side. So it, 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 it's quite amazing what uh, technology can do for all of us. Um, this year, uh, or rather the year that has just passed, we've had our very first uh, virtual exhibition, the virtual global export as the first exhibition uh, to be held uh, virtually in Botswana. I think uh, amazing, amazing. And done by young, um, young Botswana, who, who, who developed this technology and, and the platform. So I think it's something that um, you need to, 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 to give a chance to. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the other thing that um, is very, very important that uh, one has to do is to invest in data. This is the time um, for us to invest in data because data defines the destiny, defines where we're going. So it's important for us to know um, and be able to, to clean up our data harvesting as well. So that's one, one point. In addition to data harvesting, I think it's important for us to, to also invest to some extent also in uh, market intelligence so that um, we, we, we are able to drive the, the, the necessary intelligence that will show us exactly where we, we, we really headed to. So it's important for, 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 for IPAs at this point to invest significantly in, 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 in uh, market intelligence tools. The, the, the other one, I think um, John talked about it, of course, is an integrated uh, investor after care program or, or retention program. I think it's important to ensure that we retain uh, the investors that we already have in, in our countries it's important to ensure that we help them expand if, they, if there's scope and opportunity to do so. Uh, it's also important uh, to diversify by sharing with them other opportunities that are available. You see, one of the most critical things is that investors who've already set up are much easier to convince than those that are far, far away. So as part of our Investor Aftercare program, I think it's important to make sure that the three key aspects of the, the, the retention strategy uh, come out quite, uh, quite clearly. And also, I mean, um, very, very critical is the issue of uh, maintaining the leads, uh, rather maintaining the, the pipeline. Uh, from the pipeline that we have, it's always important to maintain contact, particularly at this point, with companies that are within our pipelines and ensure that um, if there are any bottlenecks uh, that inhibit um, actualization of investment, we close them down now. I think uh, even government departments are keen uh, and ready to, to, to open up and uh, make way for, for investment. So this is the time for us to, to, to maintain contact and ensure that um, the, the pipeline actually um, it, it comes through. So what is critical at this point also is follow-ups, follow-ups, follow-ups. Just to follow up with companies that we've made contact with previously, those leads may not necessarily be um, hot leads. Uh, they may be leads that we generated in our previous missions. So this could be the time for us to go back into our archives and, 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 and you know, just check up on, on the companies that we've had engagements with previously um, because things have changed. Companies are looking at opportunities for near shoring. So you, you never know. This could be a, a big opportunity for us to, to bring about uh, those companies here. Yeah. Investor targeting remains key. I think we cannot uh, put it asunder. I think this is the time for us to, to, to use market intelligence, to drive investor targeting, and use uh, digital technology uh, webinars to be in contact uh, with, with, with those uh, with those companies, and now the the last point as as IPAs, I think one of the critical areas that we 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 tend to forget is advocacy. I think this is the time for us to advocate strongly for reforms to improve the investment ecosystem, 
for for investors. So this is the the the, the, the opportune time for for us to make sure that we we close out on on on, on those advocacy matters that have been a bottleneck in our economies, and. Lastly, very critical also is building stronger ties uh, locally uh, with our local companies, local informal uh, informal sector, our SMMEs, to ensure that they link up with already existing bigger companies um, and so forth. So those are some of my thoughts uh, for now, uh, Christina, and I believe they could take us uh, far. Thank you very much for sharing that, uh, Reggie. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, I hope uh, all of you uh, here present um, um, probably share those ideas and some of you have uh, used the same strategies and actions. Uh, but I think it's absolutely true. Uh, there are so many good points that have come out of the discussion, but, you know, investing in data, investing in, in infrastructure, uh, digital infrastructure. To thank you, colleagues and friends um of the panel to taking part taking your time and um, being with us here today sharing that's absolutely fantastic john would you like to add something before we close today thank you very much uh christina uh thank you especially to the uh panel for sharing their expert activities and in a public um setting like this it's been really very uh, interesting fascinating there's been a lot of uh, synergy between some of the approaches people are taking, but at the same time, each, uh, each of you guys have talked about uh, uh, other solutions that really work for your group of businesses. Leon would like to say something. Uh, Leon, go ahead. Go ahead, Hi, John. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, yes, um, a couple of things have gone unnoticed um, over the last month. We've missed things, although President Ramaphosa, as chairman of the African Union, mentioned it, but in such a depressing mode, people are not really noticing that the African Continental Free Trade Agreement entered into force on the 1st of January. It was published very, very late. Um, actually, it was pushed through a day before the time. Normally, you've got about six, six weeks' time for those to, to, to look at. Then obviously the new agreement between the Saku countries and Mozambique on the one side and the UK on the other side, which is basically just a continuation of the current agreement the, or the, the EU agreement that, that we had. Um, so to facilitate the continuation of our agreement and relationships with the UK, that was that was concluded. But then a couple of things, and that's, 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 that's quite concerning, a couple of things have gone through unnoticed is, for example, in terms of greenhouse gases, the Kigali Amendment, there were supposed to be um, amendments in terms of greenhouse gases, um, you know, to look after the, of, of our environment. And they have gone through unnoticed. It should have been, we should have introduced a licensing system for greenhouse gases, which, which never happened. And a lot of chemicals and other products that, that, that have gone through unnoticed. So those are things that, that um, people that also deal with trade should just be aware of. And, and that is, those are the challenges and, and opportunities that we should, should work on now. Otherwise, maybe you wouldn't have worked on it, and now the, now's the opportunity to work on solutions like those, electronic solutions like those. So I agree with what your panel said. Um, look at electronic solutions, go electronically, all that, all that. that, that is basically it. If there are any questions, um, I'll attend to it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Leon. Leon. I think that though you've picked up on some very important uh, developments that could be uh, highlighted to businesses in your provinces, in your country, through your digital portal. So very good idea. Toki, where are you? <laughs> What's going on in Namibia? Tell us. Hi, John. Hi, Christine. Hello, everyone. The Namibia Investment Center is uh, transforming into a, a board, Namibia Promotion and Investment Development Board. 
So currently now, um, we are attending to inquiries and clients, but uh, our main focus is to uh, create the system for the board to, to start running. Uh, and more information, yeah, more information will be shared as, as everything uh, gets finalized uh, perhaps by April this year. Fantastic, Toki. I'm so pleased to hear that. It's going to be great for Namibia to have your own board um, and agency. Thank you. Thank you. We are excited. We look forward to, to hearing more about that. Thank you for sharing that, Toki. Thank you again, all of, your, uh, all of you, and uh, stay safe. Uh, watch out for the space. We will be announcing more webinars. And uh, if you have any suggestions on topics, we would be really happy to to take those on board because we're rolling out the program for the year so stay safe stay well and don't stop promoting thank you all for being here today and see you soon bye thank you thank you thank you everyone thank you awesome.